my brother bishops, brother priests, dear deacons, women and men living the consecrated life, our seminarians and novices and postulants, and all of you, the young church, disciples all in Christ Jesus. Can we honestly say that we are doing enough to keep our children, all of them safe from harm? If we're honest with ourselves, the answer is no. We're not doing enough and we will have to change. We can't tolerate this anymore. These tragedies must end and to end them, we must change. These are the words of President Obama following the terrible tragedy in Newtown, Connecticut. I believe his poignant words also speak to us today as we prepare to leave this place after the celebration of this Holy Mass in thanksgiving for the gift of life and make our march for life. Today, in the name of your generation, you are responding to that message saying, no, Mr. President, we are not doing enough to keep our children safe, all of them, and especially the most innocent and helpless, those who even as we celebrate this Eucharist are being put to death in abortion clinics and hospitals. I hold before you a shoebox and also a model of a 26-week-old infant. And why am I doing that? This is what I looked like when I was born on September 3rd two months premature. I was so tidy in the incubator that my grandmother used to say that I could have fit in a shoebox. We all know that life is a gift from God and our very existence is a miracle. Some lives might have more of a dramatic start that can remind all of us just how precious and miraculous life can be. Today, I'd like to share a bit of my personal story. My parents were married in 1930. For the next 10 years, they so much wanted to have a child. The doctor told them that that was not going to happen, no matter how much they desired a child. In 1940, when my mother went to the doctor telling him that she thought she was now pregnant, he initially told her that she was mistaken, but tests proved that she was right. However, during her pregnancy, my mother became ill with toxemia, a mental condition that is very dangerous to both the mother and the unborn child. So late in August, the doctor had my mother enter the hospital for complete bed rest until November, which was the time I was expected to be born. But on September 3rd, my mother went into convulsions and so I was born prematurely, two months early, and weighing only three pounds. I was baptized immediately, and my father was told to come to the hospital as soon as he could, because in the words of the doctor, 
your wife and your son will probably be dead by midnight. Well, as you can see, that did not happen. I was placed in... <laughs> I was placed in the incubator for two months and went home in November weighing about five pounds. Certainly, most mature infants did not survive in those days. I believe that the prayers of my mother and father, my relatives and their friends, had much to do with my survival. My guardian angel played a hand I am sure, and since God intended me to be a priest, no doubt our blessed mother interceded for me, saying to her son, perhaps, he is my son too, we must save him. I would like to picture St. Joseph praying for me, and I would think St. Paul, whose conversion we celebrate today, my patron saint, added his prayers. We can never underestimate the power of the saints and angels to intercede for us with the Lord. It is a wonderful practice to think about who is praying for us in heaven, who is praying for you. As I reflect on my life, I can only come to one conclusion. I was meant to be born and to survive, I believe, that I have a particular mission. Yes, certainly to be a priest, a man of faith, please God, but also as my own life was saved, as I reflect on the miracle of my existence, I know deep within my being that human life is a sacred and precious gift from God, and that I have a mission to say that to the world. Furthermore, as I look at all of you here, more than 6,000 strong, I would go on record as stating that you also are supposed to be here today. You also are each tasked with a mission from God to defend and uphold the dignity of all human life from conception until natural death. Yes, I believe each of us here today has the same mission. We have been sent for a purpose, to make a difference in this world, certainly, but in a very specific and real way. We are called to help end the destruction of innocent human life by upholding and defending the precious gift of life. How do we answer the Lord's call? How do we embrace this mission? First of all, we must acknowledge that we have been given this mission. Your presence today in this building says your yes, and I am proud of you. We answer his call also through prayer. We are praying for all making choices to end the life of their child, for those who are taking part in those choices, and for an end to abortion in the world. And then we must become educated on the beauty and truth of our Catholic teaching about human life and on the science, technology, and facts surrounding life issues so that we can speak with conviction, with confidence to our friends, our neighbors, and the larger culture. And lastly, of course, we embrace the mission to which we are called through actions. 
helping and loving those in need, voicing the truth to those who are confused about life issues, and letting our government leaders know that they too must protect human life from conception until natural death. On this day of the March for Life, your generation shines a bright light across the capital area of Washington, a light that cannot be hidden. In unison, we make our own the, vision and the visionary reality of Isaiah from today's first reading. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Upon those who lived in a land of gloom, culture of death, light has shown. You have brought them abundant joy and great rejoicing. Today's gospel account brings into focus those whom Jesus called blessed, the poor in spirit, those who mourn, those who are clean of heart, and know a hunger and thirst for justice. Significantly, Jesus also said that those are blessed who are persecuted and falsely accused because of him. Brothers and sisters, do not be afraid of insults because you stand for life. And so, as we set out to march on Capitol Hill, I am asking that you do two very specific and personal things today. First, say yes to your mission to be for life. Acknowledge today that part of the purpose of your life of the mission giving you at baptism is to bring an end to abortion and to all other acts that destroy human life. And secondly, as you march, pray, pray, that because you came, your witness rooted in prayer may save the life of one child whose parents right now are considering abortion as a solution to their problems and fears. Pray that they may be changed in mind and heart today. Dear brothers and sisters, be assured of my prayers for you today and every day. Thank you for being here and standing before the seat of government in defense of the unborn. I am so proud of each of you here and of all of those who will join us for the march. Together, as blessed John Paul II reminded us, together we are a people of life and for life unequivocally stating that as a nation, we are not doing enough to keep our children safe. We can and we must change. We must protect and defend all our children, beginning with the most helpless, vulnerable, and defenseless, the human being in the womb. Yes, with God's transforming grace, in this year of faith, we will, we will. God keep you and bless you. Amen. <laughs>